Hello, everyone. Welcome. Uh, first, let me begin before we get started. If you'd like to turn on closed captioning at the bottom of your screen, press the CCC. I'll give you a moment to do so. Thanks for being here, everyone. Wait, great music. We want to get started off in the right way on this Friday afternoon for our uh, terrific uh, afternoon um, uh, uh, meeting. And so uh, some most of you, I think, know this, but I'm Lisa Coleman. I'm the Senior Vice President for Global Inclusion and Strategic Innovation here at NYU. And I'm very excited about today. Thank you for joining us for our Beyond Performance, Engaging in Trans Liberation in the Classroom, a workshop with Dr. Kathy, Dr. Kathy Jacob. Hello, Hello, Katie. Hi, yes, thank you so much. I'm super excited to be here um, and, and thank you. My name is Dr. Katie Jekyll and um, I'm excited to be in this space with you all today. Thank you. All right, uh, let me get started. I'm gonna give an official uh, introduction of Dr. Jekyll in just a moment. Uh, this workshop, in case you do not know, um, is, oh, before I, I forgot to mention this because of the recording, excuse me, please note, as you probably heard, this program is being recorded and it will be posted uh, to the OGI YouTube page. However, the audience participation will be removed from the recording before it's uploaded. So whatever questions you ask, et cetera, feel free to share. We, that will not be shared after this, okay? Uh, we're very good at editing. Uh, we've got, had a lot of practice. Uh, so this workshop is one of two events that we've hosted this week in honor of Trans Day of Visibility, also known as TITA. TITA takes place annually on March 31st in celebration of trans and non-binary communities, highlighting their achievements and contributions to society, as well as raising awareness of the ongoing stigma and discrimination faced day in and day out. This event is part of our series uh, of an ongoing opportunities across the Office of the Global Inclusion, Diversity and Strategic Innovation, and of course, our hubs, the Center for Multicultural Education and Programs, and most importantly, uh, today, our LGBTQ plus center uh, that we offer to our faculty to further uh, deep and develop inclusive pedagogy and classroom practices at NYU that allow all our students to be recognized and affirmed across their multiple and intersecting identities. As many are aware, uh, we have ongoing efforts, including, including our inclusive uh, teaching and faculty mentorship programs, writing workshops, micro grants, just to mention some of the other ongoing work. This particular workshop extends our work with faculty and in some cases staff, in particular around trans inclusive systems and policy development. We've worked on things such as the addition of pronouns and chosen in Albert and resource development, such as our trans inclusion uh, classrooms toolkit and providing a space for faculty to develop to delve into, into dialogue and to really think more about how we can uh, more deeply engage pedagogical tools in the classroom and beyond and to be attentive to language and other inclusive practices, particularly as we can engage our students and of course one another. This work follows also a survey uh, where students reported issues related to de dead naming and misgendering. And we learned that these issues continue and that they are pervasive both in and out of the classroom, despite some of our system improvements. We have the power to shift the culture and experience of our students in the classroom, including for our trans and non-binary students. And we with our partners, and thank you to all of our partners. And I wanna also say that includes our students because they inform and in this process of co-creation, we continue to co-create and develop tools and programs. And we hope that you will take advantage and also share resources with others. Together uh, across NYU, and I mean across our global network and beyond, we can reflect and, and, and importantly identify and put into action uh, uh, ways that we can uplift and make more visible the lives and contributions of trans and non-binary communities in our daily action research, curricular classrooms, and other aspects of our work year round. So we're very excited again, as I said, so I am now honored to introduce our guest, Dr. Katie Jekyll, as I said before. Dr. Jekyll is an Associate Professor of Higher Education in the Counseling and Higher Education Department at Northern Illinois University. Additionally, they are faculty so, uh, associate in the Center for the Study of Women, Gender, and Sexuality at NIU. 
Dr. Jekyll teaches courses on the history of higher education, gender and sexuality studies, in, higher, in, in teaching and learning in post-secondary post contexts, and transgender studies. And in addition to their role, Dr. Jekyll has served as a faculty advisor to LGBTQ plus organizations, helped facilitate trans allied training on campus, and assisted various uh, faculty development initiatives to promote inclusive pedagogy, which means that they are very busy. Dr. Uh, Jekyll's uh, research centers primarily on post-secondary classroom experiences of queer and trans college students. Specifically, this research examines how students' experiences in the classroom uh, mediate and impact overall experience on campus and how these classroom experiences also impact their participation in their specific classes, choice of major, and other things related to that. In addition, their research also examines ways faculty development can provide practical ways to include and affirm trans students in the classroom. In addition to asking for pronouns, Dr. Jekyll advocates for curricular and pedagogical transformation to ensure trans students see themselves reflected in the curriculum. And let me just say on a personal note, I'm just thrilled to have you here. I, uh, I always do my research in the background and look up uh, people's work, et cetera. And so thank you for your contributions, not just to Northern Illinois University, but to the to you know larger sort of uh, pedagog for larger pedagogical well, pedagogical tools and for being with us here today. With that said, thank you. And I give a warm welcome and turn it over to you, Dr. Jake. Thank you so much, Dr. Coleman. That's incredibly kind. Um, and I couldn't be happier to be here. I'm so incredibly excited. Um, <clears throat> as shared, um, I'm Dr. Katie Jekyll. I use they, them pronouns. And I'm here to hang out with you all, hopefully have some fun. Um, I do have a presentation that I'm going to share. And so it's that point in the presentation where I awkwardly like go to get my presentation and then I try to like kill time so that you don't know that I'm searching for my presentation. So that's what's happening right now. Um, but you all should be able to see it. I think I successfully navigated that gauntlet. Okay, here it is. Everybody loves a good PowerPoint presentation. My promise to you is that this isn't just gonna be a boring PowerPoint presentation that I will stop it, ask for engagement. Um, before um, we delve into things, I wanna tell you a little bit about me. That was such a lovely biography and it made me sound really fancy. I think anytime that I talk with faculty, I, I do a lot of faculty professional development in my career. I need you to know that I have been teaching for 16 years, a little over 16 years. That doesn't seem like that much, but for eight of those years, I was teaching first and second year writing. And so for my fellow first and second year writing faculty on this call, we all know that each year equals 30 years when you teach first year writing. So I've been teaching for hundreds of years um, by that metric. I share this with you for a couple of reasons. I am well acquainted with the pressures of faculty work both in contingent faculty lines, um, instructor lines, as well as uh, tenure track lines. And so I know the pressures that are on each of you. And I know that sometimes asking you to do one more thing can feel overwhelming, um, but I promise um, I recognize this. And, and I think that there are some really practical ways that we can transform our classroom spaces into ones that uh, really foster and facilitate trans liberation. As shared, much of my research has focused on trans students particularly. Um, and a lot of that research, formal and informal, are in today's presentation. I do my due diligence of providing citations. I also, um, when preparing for this, I am a faculty advisor for a student group. Uh, we call ourselves trans, the Transaction Task Force. I actually really sought a lot of their input and a lot of their voices in this. Um, to ensure that I was providing information and lived experiences that uh, were current, that really sort of plagued them. Um, and so uh, I offer that up as well. We had a big day yesterday for our own TDEV celebration, um, which was lovely. Um, we delivered a list of demands to our senior administrators for trans inclusion. Um, and so it's a, a very activist group, activist oriented group. And so I'm excited to, to sort of share out with about them. 
<clears throat> and then as mentioned, I, I, there isn't a lot of things I haven't done on this campus, but uh, in particular, I co-facilitate a lot of um, trainings, educational uh, opportunities and professional development for our campus, um, both for faculty as well as, as staff and students. And so I'm, I'm really, really excited to be here. And I, I share this with you so that you realize that this presentation isn't gonna be a highly theoretical one where I expect the world from you, but rather one where I understand um, what it is to teach in the classroom and online. And so we're in this together. I wanted to provide sort of what I hope to accomplish today. I'm gonna to first start out with language and terms. Um, I do that because how I use trans um, both in my research, in my scholarship, and, and in my day-to-day -day life, and my own identity, might be different. Um, it's really important to remember that the trans community is not a monolith. There is no one trans experience. And so to that end, I think it's important that I sort of share out with you how I've come to understand and use this term. Um, so uh, I'll provide that. And then I'm going to give you a quick overview of research about trans students' experiences. I can't imagine it's anything new, but I provide that, and that's where a lot of my students' voices are, are going to be featured. I'm also um, offering a model for how we can make sense of trans liberation in our classrooms, sort of a, a framework as it were, for us to operate under. Um, and it's, it's through this idea that I'm hoping that we can imagine possibilities. For me, that's a lot of what trans is. It's the transgression of uh, typical binary notions, um, and ideas, but rather it's, it's an imagining of a possibility that provides opportunity to think beyond what it is that we always do and, and wonder what we could do. And then, um, because it would be super boring to hear me the whole time, uh, we're gonna go into small groups and dialogue about different strategies that we could do based on some of the ideas we got from our model and then come back together and share out the larger group. Um, and then there'll be time for questions and wonderful things. I wanna first start out with how I use the term trans and I need y'all to know, like everything in academia, like this is somewhat hotly contested. Um, there are folks in the community who hate that trans is being used as an asterisk. There are folks in the community that love it. There are folks who are indifferent about it. I'm taking it up here. Um, I take it up here alongside other scholars in the field, such as Chase Catalano, Z. Nicolazzo, and others. Um, and I'm using it as a means of inclusion. Uh, myself, uh, as well as many of those with whom I work with, realize that to be trans, to transgress typified notions of gender, it, it's not a monolith. And so to that end, it really is this inclusion of non-binary folks, transgender folks, genderqueer, um, and those of us who sort of push beyond these binary systems. I also use this because it's a visual disruption. And I, I very much identify with that because on my campus and, and within my life, I am a visual disruption. I'm often read as a cis man walking down the streets. And until I say something, I'm, I'm treated that way. The second that I say something with my apparently feminine voice, I become a disruption in how people understand the world. Um, recently, I was doing a, a training for trans inclusion in the classroom on my campus and listened to a participant verbally process through her panic of what and how she was gonna address me because when she walked into the room and saw me, she understood me to be a man, a cis man. And then she heard me joking around with somebody and heard that I had a quote unquote woman's voice and then sort of verbally processed through her panic of how she was gonna interact with me, what she was gonna call me and what she would even talk with me about. And so I become then this visual disruption for them and I need to make space for that. I believe that it's this really great thing where I'm fracturing systems, but there are some other sort of drawbacks. And so I wanna note that as best I can in these terms. I used to be a really cool person who studied um, English and linguistics. And so I also love that it's a linguistic disruption when you're reading my articles in print, 
um, when you're reading Z. Nicolazzo's work and Chase Catalano's work, I love that there is this marker that makes you stop that we don't typically see in scholarly production. And I use it because we seemingly express a solid identity, but indeed our identities are fractious. They are contested, they are varied, they're contextual, they change. Um, and so for me, that, that asterisk provides that flexibility, that fluidity, um, and is a nod to gender as a spectrum within and possibly especially in the trans community. If you're sad about it, there's lots of other people who are sad about it too. I hear you. This is a last minute ad and it came from a training that I did. Um, for whatever reason, nearly everybody who thinks through, and, and I wanna note, yep, pink news isn't scholarly and this is a meme and it was on social media, but I think it exemplifies a really critical point. People think that my job is to, I think, police bathrooms and enforce pronouns. Um, that's, that's not my job. My job is actually, um, I teach school. Um, but I, I want us to note that typically when folks think of trans issues, these are the things that they think about. If I had to update this, I would also put apparently youth sports. That seems to be a thing for folks right now. I need you all to know that these are not actually the biggest trans issues. They're important, yep. Um, but it's so much more than pronouns and bathrooms. A side note, I've bought myself a little badge so that I can wear it when I walk around campus policing bathrooms. Um, but that's not uh, the biggest portion of my job. The biggest portion of my job is supporting students through a variety of different issues. Whether it's getting even on the waiting list or finding a, a healthcare professional that can provide gender affirming care or even basic healthcare, um, homelessness. Um, I would argue also um, I, some things that aren't on here that I wish that they were um, around sexual assault, different aspects about um, things that happen in the classroom, harassment. And so, um, I want us to sort of imagine possibilities of what might trans inclusion look if we just let pronouns and bathrooms sort of sit over here and, and instead did some other things that supported students. And so I, I share that ahead of sort of the, the national literature on trans students' experiences in higher education to note that um, this is ongoing, this is, um, this is fluid, this is flexible, but of that, what we do know is, and, and note there is no dearth of education literature about trans students in college, there's a lot. Um, what we do know is that overarchingly, the campus climate continues to be chilly. You'll see I've noted that there is a difference between LGB T climate surveys and climate surveys that specifically look at trans folks. For years and years, uh, literature and I think the larger social world has conflated the needs of the LGB community with the T community. They've sort of conflated these populations. While they might share some attributes, they are different. That said, from what we do know, um, the climate is, is chilly, which is a higher ed word. Finding out specifically how trans students experience their college campuses can be really difficult because data systems are usually binary and heterogendered. Um, it can be really difficult to have trans students trust us enough to collect that data. And um, we live in a world right now where uh, the N, the number of participants needs to be significant. And the the, the world is sort of divided on what is a significant population. So I say that as a, sort of a precursor of, we know that things aren't going great, we know what things aren't going great, but the national data, we're, we're still sort of waiting on some of that. That's partially impacted by the fact that um, our latest census didn't collect our data, uh, didn't collect a lot of friends' data, and so we can't necessarily make some of those big data thoughts on it. That said, we know that most college processes, policies, and practices are trans exclusionary. Many institutions continue to not include uh, us in their non-discrimination policies. 
our institutional forms, whether that's all the way through admissions to graduation, our learning management systems consistently hold binary and pull from legal documents. Um, housing is, is an issue. Facilities, bathrooms, yes. I would argue also other facilities, um, highly gendered spaces on college campuses. This is also seen in a lack of resources for support, whether that's just fundamental misinformation people have about trans folks or no information about trans folks. Jonathan Pryor did a study in 2015 that revealed actually few folks knew best practices about even how to engage and handle trans topics in the classroom, which could be easily remedied by offering professional development. And that there is just an overall lack of queer and trans curriculum in these classroom spaces, um, whether there's been risk assigned to it of, oh, it's a risky subject to talk about, or folks just not thinking that it's germane to their topic. We know it's just sort of not happening there. We do know that trans students continually face both implicit and explicit forms of marginalization, but it looks a lot of different ways. To sort of um, complement this, I've pulled from both from some empirical research that I've done, but also from some of um, my students' experiences about what has happened to them in the last six months to offer and sort of bring to life some of that literature. It sounds like um, themes across most college campuses are really trying to figure out how do we engage folks to avoid misgendering, misnaming and or dead naming folks um, because of our systems, whether it's PeopleSoft or, or whatever sort of systems our, our campuses are using are pulling from those legal uh, spaces. So certainly that continues to happen. There's a, a pervasive fear that students will be outed in class as trans. I have a number of students who um, pass or who are stealth, meaning that they look cis. They would like to keep it that way in particular classroom environments um, because of, of they're worried about what will be perceived of them. And so if a faculty member outs them, whether it's on purpose or by accident, it causes um, pervasive fear. I think one of the most striking ones for me is having to sit through a classroom debate, whether um, it's a debate about if trans people should even get to use public restrooms, or it's a debate about the Olympics, or should trans students sit in sports or trans affirming care. But there's a number of students who are having to sit in these classroom spaces and hear their peers and their faculty adjudicate sort of what they should and shouldn't be able to do. Whether or not um, conversion therapy is ethical or right and having to listen to people say, no, I think we should do it, right? So these openly debated topics are really impacting um, students who are just having to sit there and sort of take it. There's a, a pervasive fear around group assignments, particularly how might peers um, treat a particular student and are there steps to talk about, hey, use these pronouns for me, use this name for me. I had a student once who opted out of an assignment, failed an assignment because the group kept meeting at a bar to do their work together and they didn't feel safe. A number of students, and we've seen this in the, in the pandemic, take either large lecture courses or online courses to blend in so that they could just sort of get by um, so that they don't have to out themselves so that people don't have to sort of like regularly um, refer to them in any particular way. Certainly the lack of inclusion around curricular materials uh, concerningly blatant misinformation uh, about trans bodies. And then when students go to correct the blatant misinformation, being told that they're wrong. Um, recently, a student shared that their faculty member said that you couldn't be trans unless you were on hormone replacement therapy. The student said, no, I'm trans and I'm not on HRT. The faculty said, nope, you're wrong. So sort of the devaluing of, of what it means to have these lived realities. A number of students dropping or failing courses based on a reputation of a faculty member. Students have like this unbelievable messaging uh, system going on through um, Discord or GroupMe or WhatsApp of, 
hey, have you heard about this faculty member? Yep. Were they cool? Yep. Okay, I'll take the course. Have you heard about this one? I have, and they're not cool. They dropped the course. This has led to, and I've written an article about a st students accidentally majoring in things, accidentally minoring in things based on faculty members that were really supportive. So they just kept, kept taking their classes. My favorite is a student accidentally minoring in Japanese because it's not a gendered language. They didn't want to take Spanish because they would have had to have gendered themselves and because romance, you know, the romance languages. So they took, they took Japanese. So this kid has a minor in Japanese. How lovely is that? But that has real implications for career um, placements. And then faculty either not addressing or interrupting transphobia, just letting it go. It, it becomes that you're complicit in this. We've shared some of the, the barriers that we see and some of the issues that we see. A lot of times what we see is institutions going to ameliorate a lot of these issues and these barriers through um, what back in, even in 1995, before I even went to college, they called virtual equality. And this was what Vade was, was talking about in terms of lesbian and gay rights when they were mainstreamed, which is really just how can we treat gay and lesbians the same way as we treat heterosexual folks. It made it seem like there was equality. We saw that with marriage of like, well, now that the gay and lesbian communities can get married, we're all the same, we're all equal. And that of course was not the case. There were structural levels, structural issues that continued to plague and continue to plague uh, the lesbian and gay uh, communities. We see that too with trans folks. In many ways, it's the pronouns in the bathrooms that have become these little proxies for inclusion, where it's not uncommon for us to say, well, this campus has 32 gender inclusive restrooms, so we did it. Um, when really, if we go back to that list of, of things that our trans students talked about that, that happened to them, bathrooms are neat. Yes, we totally need them, um, but it's more than bathrooms. And, and so to many, these bathrooms become just sort of a performance of, yeah, but you, you changed the facility, great. Yes, it's expensive. Yes, signage has to go through Marcom and it took a long time. Um, but there are other changes that we can make that would move us towards liberation instead of just equality. And I'm talking here about a li liberation from binaries, from heterogenderism, from oppressive institutional policies and systems uh, that actually are inside of our classrooms. So to quickly operationalize, and this is also where I asked um, my students, what, what actually is trans liberation? Now, not all of the things they said were appropriate. So it's not all here. Um, what is happening? Your fly is here. Um, sorry. So for, for them, trans liberation was more than this visibility. And, and I offer this on the heels of TDOV um, and TDOR, which is in the full. But in acknowledging that systems are not accidentally designed, they're not accidentally implemented. They were designed to uphold a binary system for a variety of reasons. If it's collecting biological sex that we call gender for federal reporting data uh, around FAFSA financial aid stuff, whether it's um, this panic around um, intermingling genders in gendered spaces because of the, the notion that trans folks are, um, are sexual predators, right? These have been largely upheld. They're not accidental. That's for some people really difficult to sort of understand, but um, it's, it's something that's really important in trans liberation is that these, these things that happen to them at the systems level were purposely done. Now, all of us who engage in them, are we purposely doing this? No, but again, this is up at the system level. Trans liberation is the inclusion of trans voices and experiences of expertise in educational spaces of actual inclusion and authoring. Other students said it was the ability to be authentically themselves. Many of my students talk about how their greatest desire is to go swimming without a shirt on and to not be judged for what their chest looks like. To understand that representation is holistic, that it would be accurate and it would be inclusive of trans voices, not sort of caricatures of what trans people are. 
Um, and it's a show of love, of support and of acceptance. And it's folks showing up for them and assisting and not obscuring, um, and that's important. So sort of using that idea of trans liberation, I want us to apply those ideas to this model. Um, and the first is to remember that because I, I get a lot of folks saying, but my classroom isn't like this. You know, my classroom is a safe place. They know they can trust me. They, they understand that, you know, that stuff happens there, but when they come in here, it, it stays at the door. I get that a lot, this idea that they're like magnets sucking problems up at the door. Except that we live in a social world. And so that social context is absolutely showing up in your classroom. The, the legislation banning trans kids from swimming or youth sports, maybe that's not what your class is about, but that still happened. People still consumed that information and they are holding that while they're sitting there. They're holding the implicit and explicit messages from campus, from the larger sociocultural context, and then it's absolutely mediating how they engage in meaning making in your course. That coupled with the institutional environment, um, whether that is um, non-discrimination policies that you do or don't have, um, inclusive facilities to live in, um, opportunities to engage with like-minded peers and to create communities, all of that is also in your classroom because our students are, are living in, in these multiple places. And then how those are reified and or fractured by our pedagogy, how we teach, whether or not we interrupt stuff, if we are student-centered, if we are um, using names and pronouns that the students identify with, how we do mistake recovery, what we know is mistakes will always happen, um, but how are we engaging in the recovery of those mistakes? Do we acknowledge it and move on? Um, which is the better practice than crying and saying like, I can't believe I've done this, like don't do that. But um, all of those things are working together in your classroom. And so we can't just say, you know, the world is happening out there, but here we're gonna believe that everybody is equal. It doesn't quite work like that. And how you engage in the teaching about your, your class impacts that. So to that end, I want us to get into breakout groups and I want you to think of a specific class or, or educational space that you have some sphere of influence in, whether you're the, the faculty member, whether you are a participant in it, you know, do you get to design it? And I want you to think about the, the outcomes and the goals, the objectives, whatever sort of the terminology you adhere to, the assessments and the methods of your instruction of that particular space. And then I want us to try to think, how can we enact trans liberation in that space by moving beyond pronouns to ensure that we're actually engaging and assisting, assisting in this trans liberation? I know this is a big ask. Um, I know that I've just sort of asked the, the world because how do you imagine possibility and possibility models when I haven't given you the possibility models? But I'm hopeful that in these small groups that you can sort of trade ideas of, okay, if we, yep, pronouns, yep, bathrooms, what are things that you specifically can do in your classroom that lead to trans liberation, including trans voices, you know, showing up with love and care, um, providing opportunity to be the authentic self? What are ways in which we can really facilitate that? I will close out the program now. First, let me just say, just fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Jacob. You're so appreciative. Uh, thank you for expanding, for, for teaching us, for bringing us into a learning zone, uh, for uh, thinking, talking about the expansive nature of what's happening, right? Uh, outside of pronouns and bathrooms. Uh, and I, I found that particularly useful. So thank you. Uh, and thank you for reminding us to get those badges. You know, we should all get them. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> um, seriously now, uh, but uh, I also wanted to say, I've been giving this, um, and I saw some people writing this in here. I've been giving these talks about uh, the new normal and people keep saying, let's go back to the new normal. And I've been saying the normal wasn't great. In fact, it was kind of terrible. And so uh, what we need is a new different, 
we need to think differently. We need to imagine things differently. We need to think about new possibilities, right? And we need to move outside of the normal, actually. Uh, and so thank you for reminding us that we have a lot of work to do, that we're learning institutions. Uh, I also say, as, a, as someone who is in the classroom, we profess a lot, but do we learn? So how do we bring those learnings back in, right? And so that's really, I think, really important. And then this idea of uh, how do we move beyond you know, our training? beyond the Socratic method, beyond the things that we were all inducted into and through. And what would that rigor look like, to Karen's point? What would that rigor look like as we think about um, and what we've learned through the pandemic, as so many of you pointed out, right? Uh, but to apply that rigor in the same way that we do in so many other er other areas. And uh, the other, I, I feel like some people, uh, maybe we've talked before, but the other thing I have this joke about creating, um, because I work across our global network, and in Abu Dhabi, we, of course, you know, we have these ministries. And one of the ministries that they created recently was the Ministries of Possibility. So I love this idea, but my idea is actually that we create a ministry of mistakes and recovery and resilience. And maybe I'll add pedagogy in there because that I think, and I saw some write, someone write in their mistakes. So thanks also Dr. Jacob for reminding us that, that we can make mistakes, we can recover, we can learn, and then we can work together, right? To then think about what liberatory possibilities look like. And uh, lastly, I'll just end this by saying, I want to thank all of you, right? We can't do this work. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Some of you may have just found out about this and you took your Friday afternoon to be with us. And thanks for the music, of course, to my team. We always like to start with a little music, you know, get pumping things up, exactly. Uh, but seriously, thank you all for being here. Please share with others, right? And uh, we'll, we, of course, are gonna post some additional resources on our website, as Karen and Chris have reminded you. And of course, um, we will continue to offer as many tools and resources as we can. Um, I would just also like to thank my team, all of the people who work behind the scenes. Um, there is an incredible team that works with me. Uh, so first, let me start with these closed captioners. Thanks for being here. We're always appreciative of the partnership that we have there. Uh, thank you so much. Now, let me just try to find everybody here who's from my team. This is where I have to go. All right, constantly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I think Ren was here earlier. Thank you, Chris. Thank you, Christopher. I don't know if Christopher's still here. Thank you, Dr. Karen Jackson Weaver for all your work with the faculty and everything that you do. You and Chris and and Christopher and Kansi and Rent, you are superstars. And I say that I am lucky and humble to work with you each and every day. And again, let me also just say thank you to um, NYU. I really feel like we have a community out there that's really invested in these issues. And that's not everybody. We have a lot of work to do still. Um, but let's just continue to do the work together so that we can remember we can do better and think about um, how we transform our pedagogical practices and, of course, uh, NYU writ large. Have a good weekend, everybody, and please continue to take good care, okay? Thank you, Dr. Jacob. We'll be in touch. That's what we do once you're in our loop. <laughs>